everyone. We're just getting started. As usual, there's going to be an awkward silence at the beginning while we pull the speakers up, and then we'll dive right in. Feel free to enjoy this, <laughs> my favorite Bitcoin song ever. In the meantime, while we wait. Is it just me or does the, the sound terrible? <laughs> does it sound terrible? Your voice sounds great, but the music was so choppy. Jason is joint will be joining us momentarily. Sorry I'm late, guys. Just busy morning, lots of meetings. I'm sorry that the music sounded terrible for those of you that were in the audience. I've done you a great uh, disservice, and uh, I crave your indulgence and beg your forgiveness. Next time, it will be flawless. Jason, please request to come up onto the stage. P, did you tell people about the uh, very short window for them to uh, get Bitcoin 2022 tickets on the cheap? Not yet, but I will now. My friends, Bitcoin 2022 is going to be a life-changing event. It's inside the largest enclosed space that I have ever seen, and the speakers are going to be absolutely amazing. We just dropped some new speakers, and there are an incredible amount that are coming in the near future. The ticket prices are going to increase at the end of today. So this is your last period to get tickets at the current price, and then they'll go up, and then they'll keep going up, just like Bitcoin. So don't be left in the dust. And uh, I guess just a little bit of a pro tip, we always give a $100 discount if you pay with Bitcoin. So if you want to get the best of both worlds, you can use Strike. Pay with your debit card, pay us in Bitcoin, get that $100 discount. And then on top of that, use promo code Satoshi. I know that's not your promo code P, but that's my promo code. You can use promo code Satoshi and stack an additional 10% off. And I think Strike might be giving people a rebate too. So uh, great opportunity to get your Bitcoin 2022 tickets right now. Like I think you potentially can get up to 45% off, but a minimum of 30% off. So just uh, get it while they're cheap. I'm going to stop shilling. Jason, what is up, my man? Welcome to the stage. Uh, welcome to Twitter. I know uh, you're new here, but it's great to have you uh, and excited to introduce the Bitcoin Magazine audience a little bit more to uh, the person who I would consider one of the most inspirational and groundbreaking people in politics. Sending it over to you. What's up? Yo, what's up, man? What's up, everybody? It's really uh, nice to be here. This is my very first Twitter Spaces. When I do anything stupid, just let me know right away. And I'm really excited to talk to my boys up here. And yeah, let's get into it. I'm so excited to be here in a room full of hopefully a bunch of amazing Bitcoiners. So I guess, Jason, lots of people have heard about how you're going to airdrop Bitcoin to your town of Bull Valley. Why don't you talk a little bit about coming up with the idea and where that project is currently? What's the update? Yeah, our project right now is fully funded, which is so extremely exciting. And we're in the process of distributing the money into essentially a trust fund. And we're calling this the Cool Valley Bitcoin Trust. And it will sit in this fund for five years while we give people the education and the onboarding and also while we just assist them with holding, because that would be the most important thing of this. It's really exciting. And I want to say thank you to the Bitcoin community and so many people, like thousands and thousands of people who have reached out. And geez, I can't talk about it because I'll get emotional because I'm just so grateful for this community. And in terms of coming up with the idea, it was really organic. And it just seemed to make a lot of sense considering the circumstances of the city that I took over and the direction that I'd like to see this city go. I'd really like to see the people who live here move forward with a lot more freedom and power and autonomy in their lives. And Bitcoin just is by far for me the best way that I can help them in trying to get there. So just through thinking of that, it seemed we exposed the entire city to Bitcoin, you know, then good things are bound to happen to the people who live here. I definitely want to tease that out a little bit more. And P, feel free to jump in here too when you have a question. But okay, how did you go from a guy who might become a mayor of a city to uh, a mayor of a city who thinks that Bitcoin is the answer? I know that's a pretty wide <laughs> ranging question, but how did you get to the point where you're like, wow, Bitcoin is how I enable my my people or the people, my my constituents? 
once again, for me to get to that point, I can only show gratitude for the members of the Bitcoin community who were able to educate me to this point. I At least I thought I understood what Bitcoin was all the way back in 2015, which was the first year that I was able to interact with it in any way. And I just thought it was the cool new internet money, but I did not understand the fundamentals of like central banking. And I didn't even really understand the fundamentals of the technology. And I would say that basic understanding has come in the last year of my life and primarily from Clubhouse. Like the community on Clubhouse is dope. P is one of those people that I've actually listened to a lot, like P and Lamar Wilson and Bitcoin Tina and just so many incredible people who are so much smarter than me have taken the time to either educate me directly or even just to let me listen in on their conversations. And from learning more and more about this technology, I went from believing that it was just a cool internet money to this is obviously one of the most important inventions of human history. And it's imperative that I spend the rest of my life of doing what I can to facilitate this in the world. But that can only come through the knowledge of so many people that are smarter than me who taught me so much. And it's one of those things, when you understand the technology, then you become like where we're all at. It's the understanding that gets you there. Man, that means a ton. I I, I think you are way smarter than I am. And, I, I, I talk that. <laughs> that you can, but I also, yeah, it means a lot to hear that my, my lunatic my ravings <laughs> have benefited you and all the people that you represent. I'm curious, tell us about your kind of your career. Like what, what have you, what's your career been like? Like, how did you get to where you are today? And tell us about your constituents. Yeah, to get to where I'm at today is an entire accident. I never intended to be the mayor of this town at any point in my life. It almost seemed like a divine providence that led me to do this. But before this, I was like a very average entrepreneur, average to below average, I would say, and um, a really passionate environmentalist. So I went from the sort of private sector entrepreneurial world to really trying to shape my career in a way that could allow me to have a positive impact on mostly animals. That's my passion is, is wildlife. Uh, I spent the last five years cleaning the oceans, like pulling plastic from oceans and canals and rivers and waterways and things like that, and recycling that plastic. And I was usually more concerned with the social good aspect of it than the money making aspect of it, which is why I'm a pretty bad entrepreneur. And the circumstances that brought me to back to Cool Valley, this is where I grew up, but I hadn't lived here for some time as I've been traveling and doing my thing. And it was a family experience. I had to come back to help out a family member with a medical situation. And when I saw the conditions of the city compared to what I remembered growing up, I was really hurt. I didn't really see the city going in any kind of good direction at all. And I couldn't think of a way that I could help do most of the things that needed to be done unless I got into a, a situation where I could make some of these calls. And that's what inspired me really last minute in 2019 to run for mayor here. I'm sorry if that was like a long rambly answer, just trying to sum up my career is crazy because I've done so many things and some of them Far have done well and some of them were pretty bad. Far from longer rambly, that's actually pretty concise, man. So Jason, tell us a little bit more about like, you're mayor, you see a lot of opportunity for change. What are the first few things that you did? Because you did a lot of things that are out of the box beyond just this project to airdrop Bitcoin. But talk to us about like, how did you approach coming into office, making change, and then um, go more specifically into like, how did the people who, who worked for you and worked for the mayor's office and the city handle those kind of changes? And how do they handle this Bitcoin idea in general? I think I terrify most of the people who I inherited on my staff and also my colleagues on the board of aldermen. I just think they're absolutely horrified by some of these ideas that that I believe are just so necessary. I came into a situation that there's a very old mentality here 
my coworkers and colleagues were mostly in their like 60s and even 70s. I'm like, I'm working with 70 year old people and not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but they do not always understand, you know, why, especially with Bitcoin, <laughs> but they're starting to, they're starting to understand how some of these things are going to be beneficial. One of the first things I did when I got into office, I wanted to affect the war on drugs. I think the war on drugs is bullshit, waste of time, waste of money. And at its very worst, I see it as a pure evil way to um, imprison people for using like drugs. It's really stupid. So uh, I did decriminalize cannabis and psilocybin mushrooms within my first, I think, three months of being elected. And I don't know if anyone in Missouri had ever done that before, but it made common sense for me. I'm 31 years old. And for me to be authentic in my beliefs and life story, I had to make that move. And of course, people were terrified, but not really. There was just like this initial shock that what the fuck is this kid doing? They see me as a kid. I'm 31 years old. They see me as a kid. But after that shock, I think there's come like a bit of acceptance. Okay, like this is what's going to happen. And maybe this is actually for the best. In terms of my actual city, like our residents, they seem very happy. I don't get a lot of complaints, and I think some of them were waiting for someone younger to come into office and express some of their ideas because we've been run by old folks for so long, and it hasn't been going the way we want it to. So I think a lot of the people who live here are happy with something different. What's some of the most significant pushback that you've gotten from the, you mentioned the staff that you inherited, the people of, uh, of Cool Valley. What's the most common Bitcoin-related FUD that, that comes up? Good question. Unfortunately, I'd say the most common thing that I hear is why are you giving people Bitcoin when you could give them US dollars? <laughs> and like that, I know that's just an education thing. I could have seen myself being there if so many people didn't take the time to educate me and really spark my curiosity and what this asset is. But I, I just I hear that one probably more than any other is why don't you just give these people cash if you care about them? So it seems like that's not a valid criticism because we all know if yeah, you guess. give someone cash right now or Bitcoin in five years, we all know what's going to be more valuable. <laughs> I guess so you can't it's just, just an education thing, I think. Yeah, I guess you can't just scream at them. Cash is trash. I'm going to force y'all to hold this asset. <laughs> it's about the best I can do. And I hate saying words like that, too, because I'm very like small government and I just don't like the idea of government getting too involved in people's lives. But at the same time, I'm not giving you fiat and I'm going to make you hold your Bitcoin. It's just the right thing to do, but it's more of a gift. So I feel more comfortable in doing that. Yeah, I, I forget who it was. There's, there's a, a very famous scientist and his name is eluding me right now, but he said something like, is it really our job to drag the unwashed masses kicking and screaming into the modern era? I'm afraid that it is. And I agree with you. It's like, I don't agree. I definitely don't agree with the the premise of forcing anybody to do anything. But I think that deciding to freely give a group of people something at no cost to them in a specific form is is so far from forcing some you know anything on anyone that I feel like it applies. I'm glad you agree with me. That means a lot to me. I, I like when my residents feel good about what I'm doing because obviously they matter. Like I'm sworn to serve them. And I really love when like my OG clubhouse people like really care about or feel like I might be doing the right thing. It means a lot to me to have you guys' respect and approval because like I said, so many of y'all taught me and you're still smarter than me, especially in this space. So I'm just trying to do things the best that I can. But I do want to do us proud as Bitcoiners in this community. I hope that you guys can look at this and feel somewhat inspired or happy or just that something good is happening in the world for Bitcoin because of what we're doing. But yeah, that was one of the criticisms I've gotten. And then the other one, of course, I would say the second most common is the buying votes part of it. And on that one, I just feel like that's idiotic. No offense to anyone who believes that. But the reason I think that is you can say anything is buying votes. When I ran for office, I gave these people a list of five campaign promises. So every time I do something good for them, 
technically I'm buying a vote. I'm trying to fulfill these promises uh, that I made to them. But I did say that if it ever came down to me making sure everyone in my town gets this Bitcoin or me being mayor, then I'll just give them the Bitcoin and retire <laughs> because I don't care about being mayor right now as much as I care about improving their lives. But I don't think it's going to come to that. It's a really foolish criticism, but it's something that I hear a lot as well. So I would say those are the top two. Why don't you give them U.S. dollars and are you somehow uh, buying? Got it. Yeah, I just think it, I think it's such a power move. I think it's and it's so beneficial to your constituents, even if they don't realize it, because, as I said, you're giving them this thing freely, which we all know is the soundest money on Earth. And it's just an amazing that is the most, in my experience, one of the most effective ways to to get people involved and thinking about Bitcoin. And I certainly feel this moral imperative to help as many people get involved and understand Bitcoin as rapidly as possible because as with cash and so many of the other assets that are available to people and that are presented as what it takes to you know be a successful human, that is to say investing in them, are ultimately just melting ice cubes, cash more than almost anything else. And it's just tragic to me. That is not something that most people realize. And so I think what you're doing is pretty incredible. Bless you, P. You're absolutely right about the ice cubes. That's a really great way to put it. It is a little bit tragic. I get a little bit sad when I think about certain people's savings just disappearing. And when we look at poverty in the United States, a lot of people are working, right? Most people in the United States have some sort of income producing thing, whether it's a job an asset, or a mixture of both. But for people who are trying to elevate themselves to, let's say, this middle class, like they're trying to go from lower to middle, they're saving and they feel like, oh, maybe I should buy stocks or something. Or some people don't even buy stocks because they feel like they don't have enough money to do that and they won't buy Bitcoin if they don't know about it. So they're saving in dollars and we know what's happening. The inflation numbers are what, officially like 2%, some people say 5%, some people say more than that. And I'm sure there's some smarter people in this room who can enlighten me about that. But their savings accounts are being looted. That's what it feels like when they set aside some money and just leave it there and think when they come back in five years, that's the same amount of money. And it just isn't. And it's horrifying. Bitcoin is the answer, though. Yeah, absolutely. Jason, I feel, yeah, I feel like so... I was in Miami for the Human Rights Foundation's event titled the Oslo Freedom Forum Miami and introducing it on day one were the mayors of Miami Beach and the mayors of Miami. And they talked about how there's three political parties. There are Republicans, Democrats and mayors. And we've seen a lot of other mayors see the opportunity with Bitcoin and start to embrace Bitcoin, as well as other politicians in other areas of government. But is there do you agree with this framing that there's this like kind of a coalition of mayors uh, across the country? And what's your impression of Bitcoin being adopted by just a smaller locales such as yourself and you know others around the country? I've never heard that before, but I think it's accurate. The political parties thing, there absolutely is this coalition of mayors. And I wouldn't call us a coalition because we're really working independently. But in terms of making big changes, I believe that small town government is really where those big changes are going to happen. And that's certainly where they have the potential to happen the fastest. It's one of the things that attracts me to being the mayor of a small town of between 12 and 1500 people, depending on who fills out the census. It's, you can do more if you're courageous, I think. And if you think about it, if I want to do something here, I can either do it in partnership with the private sector right away, or if I have to go through the government, governments are so inefficient. It's so tough to make a decision in a government setting, and that's by design. But if I have to go through the government, I really only have to convince four people and two of those people have to make a decision. Whereas anything on the national scale, you're convincing hundreds and hundreds of people who all have dozens and dozens of lawyers writing things for them. And you get these like 15,000 page bills that no one's ever read and now they have to vote on it. That does not happen as much uh, in the small towns. We can really focus on doing what needs to happen. 
And there's a lot more independent thought, I think, in terms of mayors and even certain governors for sure. But for making change, I absolutely believe that starting small is the most effective way to do it. You can work with a lot of different mayors. Like we have so many cool mayors doing so many cool things. Mayor Suarez seems pretty cool, even though I don't know what that Miami coin thing's about. Y'all are y'all are gonna have to tell me about Miami coin, but he still seems like a really cool, open minded guy. I Miami think, co- yeah. I was gonna say I I have a I'm very lenient with people shit coining. I feel like there's a learning curve, but yeah, Miami coin is sus. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's garbage, right? Don't 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 buy Bitcoin. Yo, what is going on, plebs? We're going to take a break from our programming to tell you about the resurrection of our print magazine, starting with the El Salvador issue. Starting this fall, Bitcoin Magazine will be available on newsstands nationwide and at retail stores such as Barnes & Noble. Don't want to get off your couch, though? No problem. You can also go to store.bitcoinmagazine.com. So skip the line and get each issue shipped directly to your front door with our annual subscription. I'm talking four issues a year that contain exclusive interviews and profiles with leading Bitcoiners, actionable insights on the state of the market, breaking news and cultural trends, along with powerful photos and artwork from the best artists in the world. Subscribe today and get 21% off using code podcast at checkout. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, podcast at checkout. So I love I loved your comment that kind of went viral. I think it was like last week or two weeks ago where an article in mainstream media, they mix up crypto and Bitcoin. They use it synonymously. And they said title is like Mayor Airdrops Bitcoin and then under it says mayor says crypto is a revolution or gives them whatever. And you're like, I said, Bitcoin. Uh, I love that. Like talk, talk to us a little bit about just like that trend in general and making like why Bitcoin is special to you. And I guess just comment about. Yeah, I said what I said. And we have wonderful <laughs> media in this country. A lot of it, like we have so many amazing journalists in this country who actually work so hard to get the facts and fact check their facts and then report those facts. So I'm so grateful for that. But in terms of what you're saying, it seems absolutely right. There where someone says something about Bitcoin and then everyone's so quick to say crypto after it. So I just wanted to make that very, that correction because it's just one small word, but it changes the meaning of what I was saying, CK. Like you and I were the ones having that conversation. So they were quoting me talking to you and we were for sure talking about Bitcoin and why Bitcoin gives me hope. And I'm not hating every other crypto. I'm not here hating on ETH. If you want to get NFTs and stuff, buying digital art is cool. I'm an art collector. If you want art, get art. But when it comes to the hope for society to rise above some of the past evils we've been forced to deal with, that conversation needs to be had about Bitcoin. And I'm only having that conversation about Bitcoin. I wouldn't want anybody to conflate my feelings for Bitcoin with my feelings for anything else in the crypto space, even though I'm not here to hate on those things. It just, this is a Bitcoin conversation for a reason, for many reasons. Yeah, I, I think that's, it's really important. And I think that's a big part of you know what we're trying to do with Bitcoin Magazine and Bitcoin 2022 is we're not necessarily having, having a conversation about those other things. We're here to talk about Bitcoin. And that's our big differentiator. And again, I talk to journalists all the time and every single time they bring anything up about the Bitcoin industry or anything like they think is, let's just say, untasteful about that. I like to remind them about a lot of just misconceptions and and ill-informed misinformation that typically gets shared just casually as if it, it is fact. And I think just saying crypto and mixing up crypto and Bitcoin is something that we gotta keep pushing back. I agree. I agree completely. I absolutely agree, which is funny. This is a little side note, but I was just talking to my friend, uh, Sam Altman, who is not super popular in our space right now, but it just so happens that we went to the same high school. I've learned a bit from him and he's a decent guy, actually a really smart guy, a really nice guy. Worldcoin (laughs) and Bitcoin, uh, that's one of the reasons why we have to keep these conversations so separate. Like, Bitcoin is this pure, true technology. We know what it is, why it exists, what it's doing and what it's going to do. 
And if we continue to conflate that with crypto, people are going to keep coming up with crazy ideas in the crypto space. And now we're like a part of that when we really aren't. It's a completely different technology with an entirely different ethos for existing. So this subject is one of the most difficult things to to explain to people who aren't intimate with the space. I feel it's something that you're passionate about. My colleague Pete Rizzo wrote an excellent article for Forbes detailing why Bitcoin is different than other cryptos from a property rights perspective. And he makes a very compelling argument there. But I guess, do you think it's possible for Bitcoin to shed crypto from its public perception, just because I feel like it's something that, to some degrees, I think that it's like the Streisand effect for Bitcoin, like altcoins are, but in which like I think it amplifies its marketing. But on the other side, it's also like a weight, right? Because the crypto industry has so much baggage and it has so many things that are just completely unrelated to Bitcoin. It's a good question. I think as more people get heavily into Bitcoin, among that section of the population, that's always where we're going to be able to make that distinction, where it's going to make the most sense. And I do believe in the long term, as Bitcoin, it's going to do so much better than every other cryptocurrency where I think it can become accepted that, yeah, maybe this thing is different because it's already in a class of its own, but that hasn't even started yet. Like the separation of Bitcoin from these altcoins is going to be so large, I absolutely think that could happen. Yeah, again, I think that's definitely the Bitcoin Maximus perspective. P, you want to, you want, you got a question? Oh, I was just going to weigh in on that. But yeah, I think that uh, I, I, I suspect that the distinction between them will become clearer and clearer as Bitcoin becomes publicly accepted and understood. And that to me is an inevitability. I think that, and I do think that the rest of the crypto space provides very useful cover fire for Bitcoin. I think that from a regulatory perspective and from other perspectives as well, I think that entities that would otherwise be trying and ultimately failing to influence Bitcoin more, instead direct their energies into the rest of the crypto space. But I do think that it's tough because I think, and I think a lot of the time people are you know, no one is the villain in their own story. They genuinely believe that the thing that they're doing is going to be good for for the majority of people. I know that Mayor Suarez certainly does, and he's a he's an awesome dude. But I think that, but the thing that kind of causes me existential pain, so to speak, is that thinking of the people who are investing in in some of the more the worst projects, and basically just me knowing that they're going to probably get you know rugged, and then they'll miss out on this incredible lifeboat. And savings technology that is Bitcoin, but it's it's the evolution of any large system, I think. Yeah, it's a tough world, and like people have always gambled with their money. Exactly, like, it is what it is. I play poker myself; it's like my favorite game. So. My per- again, I think that's where Bitcoin or altcoins has the Streisand effect uh, is good for Bitcoin. That person gambling is still closer to Bitcoin maximalists and and still more acquainted to crypto UX to some degree. I think this is good for Bitcoin, but again, like. I am personally for the emergence of the Bitcoin ecosystem or the Bitcoin only ecosystem. Corey just joined the stage, obviously the CEO of Swan Bitcoin. And again, I think Bitcoin Magazine, Swan, and many other companies, CoinKite, Rodolfo is in the, is in the audience, are a huge part of this movement. Yeah, I'd love to get to know some of the people in here. Like I said, I, I'm like an OG, like, Bitcoin, like Clubhouse, that's where I feel like I came up where I would just listen to these people on stage and learn almost everything that I know today. But coming over here to Twitter, like there's so many people that I haven't met yet. And I just know I can get so much smarter by hearing a lot of these people talk. I, I'd love to hear from anyone that you guys think is cool, because if I can get up here and talk the whole time, I'm for sure going to be the dumbest person in the room by the end of it. I've got to learn from people. Well, I just want to end that and say thank you so much for spending this time with the MAG folks and all of us. This is really cool. And uh, yes, we were aware of your presence uh, many times over on Clubhouse, hanging out in Cafe Bitcoin and the Black Bitcoin Billionaires Club. So it was uh, always cool to see your little icon there and speaking occasionally. So it's been really fun to watch your progression over the course of the year getting to this point and glad to have you on Team Bitcoin. 
Bless you, legend. Thank you for everything y'all are doing over there in terms of just like the education and your platform. It's absolutely incredible. And we want to talk about bullish. Y'all don't even have a sell button. What? <laughs> Respect. There is no sell and there is no spoon. No, nah, that's just that. so legendary. <laughs> it's such a banger. I, I didn't want to let P off the hook there because he said these bad projects. And it's like, how, where do you draw the line when you're giving people advice on stay away from shit coins? Because when I mean, you think of some of the top 10 coins in end of 2017, early 2018, they like Cardano was like a top four coin, went down 99.8%. What are you going to do with that? I just, it's the only one that we know for sure is going to be around for your old age and for your kids and for generational wealth is Bitcoin. I just can't, I can't give any of the other ones a pass at all. I mean, you don't look, give I'm them still... a pass. You just tell me it's a shit coin. And if you want to gamble with a shit coin, you're gambling with a shit coin. Yeah. Look, I, I still, whenever I get on the phone with my parents, I make fun of them and say, you taking, uh, you getting, you letting people pay you in, in that shit coin USD. And they just laugh. And I say, but seriously, so <laughs> the US dollar is going to zero. And, I, and then they're like, calm down. You've only been here five minutes. <laughs> we have rules in my house, like for Thanksgiving, they're like, all right, you, you have to talk about anything else for at least 15 minutes before you mention Bitcoin. And I'm like, I, I can't do it. Here's Pete at every them. family dinner. Pete at every family dinner. You should go 100% Bitcoin. Just kidding. <laughs> Unless you're going to do it. <laughs> Unless you're going to do it. Yo, I see, um, I see Lamar Wilson in here. I know. Um, we've been trying to pull him up. Oh, Lamar, you came back. Okay. Amazing. We were trying oh, to pull yeah, you up earlier, you, but... Bro. But it wasn't working, so I'm glad you were able to jump in. Yeah, that was like an error or something, but it's cool. What's going on, Mayor? The Honorable Mayor Stewart, how you doing, bro? The Honorable Lamar Wilson, man. I'm doing a whole lot better now that you're up here. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I, I always love the fact that you literally executed on something. Like, you're the kind of politician that the world needs because you came in the Black Bitcoin Billionaire. You had an idea. You talked it out with counsel. I guess we were counsel, like Bitcoin counsel. Then you went through it, iterated on it yourself, and now you're executing on it. And I'm like, that is powerful. That's the kind of politics and politicians. And here's the thing. It's all in the heart of the people, bro. That's what kind of politicians we need in this country. Like the fact, even if you, had a, even if you are a small town mayor, the fact that you care for your people like that and want to give them uh, value for their future, bro, is like amazing. I think everybody needs to like cookie cutter you out for real. Man. I don't even know what to say. Thank you, bro. <laughs> like, I, I mean, that's incredible what you said, especially because I feel the same way about you. And thank you so much for being my counsel through this. I don't know if you were here earlier in the room, but I, I keep thinking that I owe so much to you and to all the people who taught me because y'all are the reason in many ways, why I'm not out here looking stupid, <laughs> like shilling something dumb, because you took the time to really help me understand what this is. So thank you so much, because I feel like I'm nothing without you all. Absolutely nothing. We all in this together, man. Like, matter of fact, there's so much bro love going on right now. I'm going to say it. I'm married Jason Stewart. Will you marry me? Will you? <laughs> oh, man. So I want to hear about, so we talked about the the project is fully funded to airdrop this Bitcoin, but a lot of partners came out of the woodwork. I'm sure a lot of conversations were happening. What can you tell us about those conversations? I'm sure Lamar can give color to sitting in on council per se, but I guess, Jason, tell us a little bit more about the details there. I'm so sorry, CK. I didn't hear the first part of your question. It, was it about just some of the other ideas we've been talking about with people? Could you repeat what you were saying? Just like when this idea came public and I guess the attention started pouring in, I'm sure a lot of people reached out. A lot of partners came out of the woodwork. Can you just talk about the evolution? Yes. So the very beginning, like the first time I mentioned to anyone that I wanted to do this outside of my residents who I've told them this since the campaign, at that point, I was actually going to use uh, some of my own money combined with some city funds. And that was the initial plan. And I had enough money to give everyone, every household around $500 in Bitcoin if I were to go that route. And with me not really being a politician, I'm like an accidental mayor. I didn't have a fundraising website or even a fundraising plan. Like I self-funded my own campaign, 95% of it. 
Uh, I didn't come in here with the intention to raise any money for this small city. I just, the idea never occurred to me. But what happened was while we were hashing this idea out, me and Lamar and, and so many people, people would start to listen. And then they started to offer support. And it was really surprising, actually. So I remember one night on Clubhouse, like 50 or 60 people just offered to give some sort of money or to do anything they could to help. And I thought, hey, that's strange. But hey, this is Clubhouse. People must just be really nice. And then a week later, our first major donor did the same thing. I was just having a conversation with a professor from Harvard, I believe, just hashing out the sort of like idea of it. And of this guy who I'm going to keep anonymous because he prefers it that way, offered to match anything that I raised up to a million dollars, just right off the bat, someone who never met me before. And I thought that was really cool and really nice. And I think after that, maybe the press started to find out about it. There's this really wonderful reporter here who was trying to get the story from me. And I kept telling her no, because I just didn't, I don't know, that wasn't my goal to be known for this at all. And eventually I said yes, because she was so nice and professional and kept asking. And she comes in and does that story that went on the news. And that's when, you know, it went viral. I think like the very next morning, Bitcoin Magazine threw the laser eyes on me. And after that, I haven't been able to keep up with the amount of people who want to help. It's thousands and thousands of people via phone, text, email, coming to City Hall, sending me mail on Twitter and LinkedIn and people want to give money, they want to give education, they want to give their time, they want to move here. There's so much going on and I'm just doing my best to manage it all and make sure that I don't miss anybody because I didn't think anyone would care about us. And now that so many people do care about us, I think it would be really cool if this project does become like a bigger thing within our community so that when we look back in history, so many people will be able to say that they played a part in it in some way. And I think that'll be an important moment for the history of Bitcoin when we look back at it. That's awesome. I mean, I'm glad that you've had so much support. We have Bill, Bill Whittaker. Bill DM'd me saying that he's from a neighboring town and has come to Cool Valley and checked it out. I think he wanted uh, a chance to say what's up, maybe talk about his impression. Thank you very much, uh, CK, for having me up. Just wanted to check in, and I did step over. I, I actually got to meet the Alder, Alderman Don Johnson, very nice man, and the woman working in the back there. And I think what you're doing is awesome. This is so exciting. I'm right down the road, and I'm working at a school. And um, some guys have I, I've talked to a bunch of people that that you know about this project. But we've got a miner, we've got some Raspberry Pis, I've got some guys in the mining industry that are willing to help get hardware out to us for the purpose of educating education programs to help young people and the city learn how to refurbish, uh, repair, set up sustainable mining operations. We have a solar plant that we're, that's an, it's a banded solar plant that's been sitting here for the last 10 years. And we're getting ready to turn that on, plug the miner in, get the batteries going. But my, my issue here is that the educational process with my board and the people that run the school, they think if I open up the Bitcoin network, it's going to be like a Ghostbusters. All hell is going to break loose. So the idea I had, if you're open, is we can get together and come over to town hall and hook up to the internet there and get some Bitcoin gatherings together. Maybe get some, I have a couple of seniors doing a senior project, but just to collaborate and, and just keep pushing what you're doing here to surrounding areas. And there's a lot of communities that could benefit from this kind of this kind of activity. So great stuff. Thanks very much for having me up and hope we get to meet soon. Wow, that sounds amazing what you're doing. I would love to meet you and explore this idea further. Is there any chance you emailed me about a month ago? I did. I emailed you. I think one of the one of the reporters from Bitcoin Magazine actually hooked me up with your email. And then I was just driving over to town to meet somebody. And I was like, I'm just going to drop in. And I drove up and Alderman Don Johnson and one of the other guys was sitting there. He was he was really cool. Took out his flip phone, took my number down. And listen, it's you're overwhelmed. And I understand. But I, I think eventually we should connect. Bless you, brother. I'd love the opportunity. Thank you for offering uh, to help teach the people over here some of those skills. I think you're on to something really important and very grateful for it. So let's definitely get together. And if you send me an, another email, I'll try not to drop that one. No problem. I will. 
Boom. The magic of the internet. I wanted to like ask about like, talking about this in public and the benefits of that. It sounds Clubhouse presented a unique opportunity to both talk to experts as well as like broadcast these kind of like conversations and ideas. It sounds again, it sounds like that was huge for uh, the progress. A- absolutely. It blew up the vision in a way that I certainly never anticipated, honestly didn't even hope for because I never thought about it. And I, I'm not trying to shill God or anything, but once again, it felt like divine providence for me, for someone like me, because I'm already an accidental mayor. I didn't really want to be here, but now I'm here. And I certainly didn't want any attention. That usually would make me uncomfortable with my personality, but Clubhouse made me feel so comfortable. Like I'm just hanging out with my friends people I genuinely love and respect and care about. So it feels like I was having these intimate conversations. And sometimes in those intimate conversations, like thousands of people would be listening. And it absolutely changed the entire narrative and made this project huge in a way that I never would have done myself. If you told me attention was going to come from this, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have ran for mayor. And I certainly, maybe I'd still give the Bitcoin because that's a lot more important to me, but it would have made me more reluctant. It would have made me uncomfortable. So the fact that it all happens on accident, just because we were talking publicly, it absolutely is the power of the internet for sure. And I know you guys experience that a lot. You guys are on here all the time talking to all these incredible people, like debating Mark Cuban. (laughs) Like It's just hilarious what's going on because everyone is able to find these things. But I certainly never would have been able to do this for myself without the help of the internet and these public platforms, because I'm just too shy. What's crazy, Mer, is that when you was talking about you're not going to shield God, I just thought of a scripture. It was like the first shall be, the last shall be first. And I think what Bitcoin does, it empowers small communities like yours. It empowers small countries like El Salvador, right? It actually flips the script on them, because what it allows you all to do is to empower not only yourselves, but also empower your people with something that's not stealing their time and something that's not stealing their actual precious work that they put in. And I'm like, man, it's it's just crazy to see how this like the the whole reason I think Bitcoin was in the beginning. When I looked at the white paper, all I saw was freedom. So it's like at the very beginning, I saw a way to get out of a system that was completely oppressive, especially to a people who look like me and you. So I, I was like, that's what I saw. It's a freedom. It's a separation away from that. And now seeing these small communities and small countries being the ones that are taking on Bitcoin right now, because there's going to come a time that everybody winds up capitulating. And guess what? You guys were the small ones and you guys will be the, the ones in the head in the, in the later days. And I think that's just amazing, man. I think that's what it's all about. It's like utilizing the technology to empower because so much of the world is built on people being in power over you. And the fact that you politicians are trying to empower your people is an amazing thing. That's deep. That's a really good scripture, bro. That's really good. Oh, go for it. Go ahead. I was just going to respond a little bit what Lamar said, because the way he said about systems and people trying to have power over you. It's so true. And I've always found it extraordinarily creepy. (laughs) Like, why do people want power over other people? I really never cared about that. I'd rather just meditate and hopefully give people some spiritual guidance so that we're free to make our own choices. But there certainly seems to be a whole class of government that like, it's almost like they get off on controlling people. It's so creepy. Mayor, can I give you a, a brighter view? Please. Of people? Please. They're like that because the without real money, which we finally have for the first time in human history, the only way to secure your wealth is to secure power. I think the will to power is there. and had Nietzsche writing about it and everybody else that was a sociopath getting in the government trying to get more power for them and their friends. The majority of that is actually just trying to secure just wealth and means and preserve it and make sure that other people can't take it away. This is why, especially in smaller governments around the world, you see anyone that gets wealthy has to get involved in government. They have no other choice or their money will be taken away by the people in power. And that will go away as Bitcoin spreads. So I do think that people are inherently good. And I think we're going to see that is true over the rest of this century as Bitcoin spreads. I absolutely love that. Nothing gives me hope in humanity like Bitcoin. The hope that Bitcoin gives me for that reason, 
thank you for sharing that too. I think you're wise. So a lot of these bad choices are survival mechanisms. And as Bitcoin releases them from that prison of having to do these things to survive, we'll start to see the better side of human nature. God bless you for sharing that. Yeah, I just, I just speak real quick from an educational perspective because this hierarchical kind of centralized power that Corey speaks to and, and Lamar is speaking to, it's baked into to all aspects of our lives, unfortunately. And this is now the second school that I've worked at where I've implemented or attempted to implement Bitcoin knowledge. And I learned in my last school that unfortunately just had to keep it a little bit under the radar. But what's cool is that young people really gravitate, gravitate towards something that's open. They gravitate to a platform where they can really just learn and they can go and there's so many aspects of Bitcoin where if you're a builder, an architect, or if you want to be creative, you can do it on and within Bitcoin. And it's cool to see young minds get excited because unfortunately, as we know, traditional education is very linear and it's set up to get people ready to be controlled in a centralized authoritative system, if I, if you want to call it that. But it's just, it, it is light and it, it's just amazing to hear these type of things taking place. And it's going to just, you can't stop it. That's what's so great about it. People will try to, they attempt to, but when people see the light, they gravitate towards it. My friends, unfortunately, I have to jump out, but I just wanted to thank everyone. And thank you, Mayor, for, for joining us. This has been- See you later, Thanks, man. Pete. Thanks so much. Adios. Yeah. Hey, I, I want to keep this one going for 30 more minutes. Uh, is that okay with you, Jason? Yeah, I'm here. All right, cool. Hey, we have a lot of new... I'm going to give up my spot, you guys. All right, Corey, thanks. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much, Mayor. Great speaking to you, Lamar. Great to see you. Bye, everybody. See you. Everyone, follow Mayor Bye, Jason you. Stewart, guys. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, Sovereign Miner, Alan, Dr. Jeff. Alex, what's up? Welcome to the state. Hey, guys. All this talk about power is great, but in my mind goes immediately to energy infrastructure and what can power the Bitcoin miners. So in that regard, Mayor, what's the energy infrastructure look like around your, your city? And is there a possibility of integrating production of the soundest money history has ever seen into uh, promoting uh, the future self-sovereignty of your town? I'm certainly open to the idea of it. In terms of understanding what our energy infrastructure is, I'm still in the process of looking into that myself because we are such a small town and I'm not imagining that we have tons of excess energy. But what I'm really interested in is showing how Bitcoin is actually accelerating humanity's adoption of renewable energy resources. So my dream project would be to have some sort of solar setup here that it facilitates even a small part of Bitcoin mining, even though it probably wouldn't be much. I do know that about 15 minutes north of me, maybe even 10 minutes north of me, our big electric company out here, Amron, does have a mining facility. Uh, they're mining up by a river, and it's very close to here. In terms of Cool Valley's specific like energy grid, these are questions that I have to take a deeper dive into myself. Maybe Bill has some answers here. Bill, it sounds like you're interested in mining and are familiar with the local area. Also super interesting that Amarin, or yeah, that your power authority is mining. I don't know, Alex, maybe you should look into that point. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool that, that they're mining, especially with the benefits that we know Bitcoin offers an energy grid by making it more efficient. So I think it's so cool that Amarin is mining and they reached out to try to collaborate as well. So I'm in conversations with them, but that aspect of it is still very new to me and I'm continuing my education so that hopefully I can really understand the mining aspect of it more because my understanding of it is very elementary. Yeah, that, just to chime in, when I got to this school, one of the things that really sparked my interest was we have this massive open area. I think a lot of colleges and these independent schools have this where they've got resources. So we have wide open land right now that's just being used to cut hay and throw it away. And so there, there's actually a gentleman, I think, in the audience who we were on a call talking about bio waste and agricultural waste and ways that we might be able to use some of the machines they have to create energy, create energy power plants based on that and in, in combination with potential solar. So that's one of the reasons we're taking this solar these solar panels offline. We're associated with a college as well that has a solar car program. So they have, you know, excess panels sitting in storage nobody's using. But my thought is to pull some of this stuff out of the dump, retrofit it, get some transform, get some, some batteries. We've had a couple donated to us. We're looking for an inverter right now. 
and really just to plug them in and see if we can power the batteries up and mine some Bitcoin and get these kids learning. But the idea in my mind is creating a prototype that could eventually be a residential power supply that's either working off of solar or a combination of solar and biofuel or bio waste and put an S9 in the basement of every house in, this, in the town, something along those lines where maybe right now that doesn't make sense. 250, half million, million dollar Bitcoin, an S9 humming in the basement, creating a little bit of a little bit of heat and mining some Bitcoin to go to the city and go to the residents might be something that could happen. But again, we got to engineer this. We need the young people learning how to problem solve. I got a kid who does electrical engineering. He's been helping out with trying to figure out how to deal with the wattage. And he helped me get, you know, get the right power supply. I got the wrong one for the first one. I got a um, one for 240 volts and we figured out it was 120. And so there's a lot of little things that you can learn and figure out, but we got to get started. And with some of these miners that are doing this actively in Texas and Wyoming, there's a lot of expertise out there to help figure out how to make this work. Yeah, brother, you got to come through City Hall when I'm up there. Send me another email. I'm going to give you my cell phone number and we'll set up something for you to come up to City Hall and we'll explore this. My fellow plebs, the Bitcoin conference is back. Bitcoin 2022, April 6th through the 9th is the ultimate pilgrimage for the Bitcoin ecosystem. The Bitcoin conference is the biggest event in all of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. We're leveling up and making this bigger and better than ever. I'm talking straight to the moon with the four day long festival in the heart of Miami at the Miami Beach Convention Center. This has something for everyone, whether you're a high-powered Bitcoin entrepreneur, a core developer, or a Bitcoin newbie, Bitcoin 2022 is the ultimate place for you to be with your people and celebrate and learn about the Bitcoin culture. So make sure to go to b.tc forward slash conference to lock in your official tickets and use promo code Satoshi for 10% off. Want more off? Pay in Bitcoin and you'll receive $100 off general admission and $1,000 off whale pass. Those are stackable. So go to b.tc forward slash conference and attend the best conference in Bitcoin history. Yo, my fellow Bitcoin lovers, have I got something specifically curated for you. The Deep Dive is Bitcoin Magazine's premium markets intelligence newsletter. This isn't some paid group shilling buy and sell signals. No, this is a premium Bitcoin analysis led by Dylan LeClaire and his team of analysts. They break down in an easily digestible way what is happening on chain, in the derivatives markets, and in the greater macro backdrop context for Bitcoin. This newsletter turns volatility into a joke. So hit up members.bitcoin.magazine.com and use promo code podcast for 30% off the deep dive. That's members.bitcoinmagazine.com, promo code podcast for 30% off. Divorce your pay group and learn why Bitcoin is the strongest asset by Dylan and LeClaire and his team. I have a question for you, Mayor Jason Stewart. So you said you're an environmentalist and Bitcoiners think that proof of work and mining is going to be a huge part of saving the ecos, the environment and, and making the earth a beautiful place. Can you talk about that, that cognitive dissonance a little bit? Yeah, Bitcoiners are absolutely correct in that assumption. As you look into the actual science and data that we have, it's very clear that Bitcoin is actually good for the environment. Not only is the energy usage worth it, but that's, I would say, one of our arguments we hear a lot. We're using a lot of energy, but it's worth it. Yeah, that's true. But in addition to that, Bitcoin is a net positive for the environment. It makes our energy grids more efficient. It captures lost energy. It creates markets for energy where people can actually pay to set up energy grids in places where we never had a financial incentive before. And ultimately, at the end of this, we will look back and say that Bitcoin was likely the biggest accelerant for humanity in adopting permanent renewable energy because the system of mining incentivizes that. It's the only financial thing that makes sense. And that's where it's pushing the world. We've had these technologies like solar and wind and flared gas capturing for a long time, but it's not always financially efficient for any individual or group to go capture that energy and use it. And Bitcoin perfectly aligns our incentives there. So if we really care about pushing through to renewable technology, renewable energy, we have to you know, support Bitcoin if we care about that happening faster. 
because it's the biggest accelerant that we have. But like you said, there is that cognitive dissonance because, oh, it's energy usage. Everyone's worried that we're boiling the oceans and that we're constantly polluting the air, but we can get into that conversation too with these legacy systems. And that's a long conversation, but a lot of people don't want to dive into the petrodollar. But Bitcoin Magazine has never been afraid to educate people about the petrodollar. And I think more people should learn about that as well when it comes to energy usage and money. Who wants to jump in? Hey, Mayor, how's it going? Fellow St. Louisian here. Very awesome what you're doing in your small town. Just a question for you real quick. I know the area you're in is around the Normandy area of St. Louis. I know for the last couple of years, the public schooling system there has been struggling, to say the least. I'm curious if you've had any conversations with administrators there about implementing some kind of Bitcoin education or mining education programs for the students there. Yeah, I'm in some conversations with the school board. And how do I say this? I think that sometimes the schools here struggle because of a lack of vision. And I have unfortunately experienced that from time to time. A good example of this lack of vision would be I was trying to educate our local school. It's called Cool Valley Innovation High School. And actually, Ms. Naja Roberts came by. I'm sure a lot of y'all know Ms. Naja. And our goal was to educate all the students about Bitcoin and actually to give them uh, some Bitcoin as well. So we had this event at the school and the kids are loving it. The kids are so excited to, to get some free Bitcoin, to learn about Bitcoin. They are just so in love with this idea. But then the principal got freaked out because she was afraid of, of COVID, even though we were like outside and everyone had masks and all this stuff. And she ended the event before the kids could really go through the process of learning and getting their Bitcoin. And I thought that was really short-sighted. And I think that a lot of the schools up here, they're governed by the same body. And they're, I don't know, sometimes they're just not as open-minded as they need to be. I will say the good thing in Missouri is Missouri makes it very easy to have a charter school or to homeschool your kids or to create a new school if you want to. And I'm starting to think that might be the answer for a lot of people when it comes to educating their own children. I know that's, that's a whole tangent because we're getting into the schooling part of it, but you opened up a can of worms for me because you're right. These school districts are struggling and I've always felt bad. I came up through these school districts, but sometimes, I don't know, you're a victim of your own mistakes your own bad decisions. I do think that things can get better. Hey, Mayor Stewart, I had a question. Forgive me if you already answered this at the beginning. I missed the very beginning. But how do you parse your duties as a mayor and your advocacy for Bitcoin and getting Bitcoin into the hands of your citizens now? It seems to me that a lot of people who come into the Bitcoin space take up the Bitcoin agenda of spreading adoption as one of their primary focuses. So I was just wondering about that balancing act and what you think about those things. It's a good question. Let me clear my mind and really think about what you just said. It's interesting. I think the way that I've been balancing this, it hasn't really been balanced. I've been leaning on the private sector. My duties as mayor and what I'm doing with Bitcoin, like they are aligned, but I'm primarily handling this Bitcoin project in the private sector. And I'm doing that because I believe government is so inefficient and giving large amounts of money to government, even a local government, could just be a death sentence to that money. So I have my job as mayor to make sure the city doesn't go bankrupt or anything like that. I'm also the head of police, so I have to make sure my people are safe and doing those things and me wishing for them to be financially well off, that's almost more coming from my soul, from my spirit, than it's coming from my job responsibility as mayor. And I just think that maybe being a mayor has given me a platform to follow through with that vision. But I I don't know if that answers your question. I, I, I think you're getting at, did I get close to answering your question? Feel free to ask it again. I'd like to dive into this idea a little bit deeper. I just want to make sure that I'm hitting around the area uh, that you're reaching for. Yeah, totally. I'm just wondering how this public life versus personal life versus mayoral life versus a private citizen life, it seems like an awful lot to balance to me. And you're such a good spokesperson for Bitcoin that I just wondered if you try to segregate these kind of identities at all, or if 
you're just taken with this one task of spreading Bitcoin and helping your citizens that way. I would say the, the latter. I'm more taken with the mission and I see the Bitcoin advocacy as my mission, whether I were a mayor or not. But my life, I don't separate it too much. My entire life is this job. Like I've always been that sort of person, though. I'm completely engulfed in my work. So it just becomes a part of me for sure. There's not much separation. You're right. It is a lot to handle um, dealing with my personal life and dealing with being a mayor and then dealing with, uh, you know, all the other things that go on. But I see it as one big thing. And being a mayor just seems to be a great platform for me to try to get this advocacy out. And I'm very fortunate that the people who live here want to see the same future that I do. And, and thus, they give me the opportunity to be here and get these ideas out. So we got yeah, John. Yeah, we got John Logan. We got Dadu, who, have, who I think are up next. So John, why don't you go? And then Dadu, you can go uh, after. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, hey, Mayor Stewart, man, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for just being so progressive in your philosophy and leaning in on something that you really believe in, being unapologetic about all the things that Bitcoin can be to so many people. So I appreciate that. Just a little earlier, you were speaking about the, as an environmentalist, you were speaking about like the energy aspect and how the FUD around how Bitcoin will eat up the world's energy and so forth. And you spoke to all the good things about how Bitcoin will essentially cause like a, a, a resurgence of people really looking for ways to have more renewable energy sources. People need, they need data, right? They need something really hardcore to look at. What, how can you point people in the right direction? Like where can you point them to say, hey, listen, from an environmentalist standpoint, you certainly will have this. How, what references can you give some of the listeners out there that will surely clearly point them in the right direction and say, hey, look at this. Bitcoin will clearly cause and incentivize people to look for more renewable energy sources because this is a hot talking point, right? People always want to say it's going to eat up. The FUD mongers will always say that Bitcoin will eat up the world and cause climate to, to changes in, in, in the negative way. How can you quell some of that FUD and give people real data points? Because I think that's what people need. How might you be able to do that? A great question, brother. Thank you so much for keeping the conversation here because it's really important. I think that there are so many great resources. If there were someone who is full of energy FUD, but sincerely wants to learn and will put in the work, I would tell them to one, follow Bitcoin Magazine, subscribe to Bitcoin Magazine. They have so many great writers who are destroying the energy flood argument. It seems like every single week. There's also a really great tweet, probably back from August or something. I don't remember. But Dan Held, I'm sure a lot of you guys know Dan Held. He has a really wonderful piece that he did that puts together a lot of the counter arguments to the energy flood and compiles them into one place. And for an even deeper dive, I personally really enjoyed the paper that Cash App put out in partnership with, I believe it was Kathy Wood's ARC Investment Fund. And so this paper was just like some of the best research that I've seen showing how Bitcoin is accelerating the adoption of solar. So I would point people towards those three resources maybe to start, and that should get them going pretty far down the right path. Thank you so much for that. I think people really need to hear that. They really need to be true advocates unapologetically. You're doing a great job with it. Anything that you're doing as far as education, a uh, big, huge supporter of, of Sister Naja Roberts. It's a shame to hear that kind of that event was not totally expanded that you were doing out there at Cool Valley Tech, the school that you mentioned. Anything you're doing over there, please, man. I'm looking to support you in any way I can. I'm over here in New York City, but listen, uh, you got a partner over here. So thanks again for all that. And uh, hopefully we can connect, brother. Bless you so much. I really appreciate you. Yes, sir. Likewise. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Dadu, why don't you take over? Uh, what's going on, everybody? Um, thank you, Mayor Stewart, for all the stuff that you, you're doing for the space. I truly appreciate it. Just to change gears here really quickly, like I was curious to know, I, I know that Bitcoin kind of fits perfectly into your objectives that you want to do as far as righting the past wrongs and enabling citizens to have freedom via Bitcoin. My main question was, I know that like the medium income rate for Cool Valley is somewhere around 30 or 40K. How do you see that $500 of exposure to Bitcoin, removing or lowering the poverty rate in, in, in your county over the next few years and decades? Because a lot of people may not think 500 bucks is a lot of money, but when you're dealing with something that has such number go up capacity, it has the ability to really double and triple 
those gains, do you think that in the future people will actually start to see a financial benefit from that $500 airdrop in the next few years? Only double or triple? Is this a bear room? Are we all bears in here like that? I'm just playing with you, bro. Yeah, I absolutely think that they'll see the benefit. This is why it was so important for me to set up the trust, the trust fund aspect of it, where they are going to receive their asset after five years so that it's like a proof in their mind. It's like, I'm getting them off of zero, I'm exposing them to it, and they're going to see several runs up and down, but they're going to notice that it always trends up and up. And in five years, who knows what that, but $1,000 is what we're giving them. And I personally believe that $1,000 in five years is going to turn into enough to make it to where no one will be below the poverty line. I believe we'll have an entire city without poverty. We do have a relatively low median income, but a lot of that too is uh, we have a lot of older people that live here and they're retired. So they're living on their savings and retirement accounts. Technically, even me, like I live on savings and investments. I donate my entire salary back to the city. Um, So we have a lot of people here who are just, they're retired. So they're not earning as much as they were, but they have a nest egg. And God bless them. I really hope that they start to keep a significant portion of that nest egg in Bitcoin. I really just hope that, because it's not just the thousand dollars that we're giving them. We're giving them education as well and the tools to financially empower themselves so they can match our thousand dollars with their own money. Who knows, with all the support we're getting, maybe I can come back and give them more than a thousand dollars. But I absolutely believe that this project has a chance to completely eliminate poverty within the city of Cool Valley. Yeah, Thank I mean, you for like, that. That was brilliant. I feel like if you're in Bitcoin for four to five years, uh, if the cycles continue to play out how we've seen them in the past, there's no way that you, you haven't at least 10, if not more. That's a minimum. It, it's I think that the time lock is a very interesting aspect and component of this whole thing, Mayor Stewart. And I'm curious, can you break down exactly like what qualifies a resident to actually receive the Bitcoin? Because I feel a lot of small towns, they have brain drain. And I think that the way that you're thinking about this, as well as the current climate, it it actually combats brain drain to some degree. Yeah. Oh, could you, before I go, could you get into brain drain just a little bit? Like when you say that towns have brain drain, what do you think that's coming from? I'm assuming that means like a mental fatigue situation. No, uh, no, when- I meant like the talent in those towns leave to go to bigger cities for job opportunities. You even see that in smaller countries, like pretty much remittances is proof of brain drain as in talent is leaving and then they're sending money back. In terms of just keeping people at, in Cool Valley, what is the the five thousand or the $1,000 locked up for five years? How does that fit into that? Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Brain drain makes a lot of sense because I actually left Cool Valley myself because I needed to go get some opportunities. I think that our town overall, like with with this one particular small town, it's really important to understand that we're probably a bit of an anomaly when it comes to most statistics. And we might have some brain drain for sure because people will spread out for opportunities but we also have an abnormally high percentage of our population that's lived here for 60 years and inherited their house from their parents since before Cool Valley was even a city. And that just makes us a bit of an anomaly. Most of the people who live here have lived here for a very long time. That said, I do hope that the Bitcoin incentive gets more people to stay, especially younger people. And I hope that it attracts a few people as well who are hoping to like better their lives and see that as an opportunity to do so. The only real qualification right now is that you have to live here for five years. So if you've already lived here for five years, great, you're already qualified. If you just moved here, you just have to live here for five years and you'll be able to unlock um, your Bitcoin from the trust. I have toyed with the idea that I want people to do one social good in order to access their Bitcoin. But I didn't want, I don't want to put that in there anymore because I don't want to exclude a single person. And I just feel like by me asking everyone to do a social good, even though that will be good for the community, I think that opens the door to maybe missing some people. 
So I think I'm going to eliminate the social good aspect. And this will just be a live here for five years situation and you can unlock your Bitcoin. If I could, Mr. Host, I would like, where can we find some of those parameters around? Is that public to, to the public who could find out what is required, the prerequisites to get the air job? It's not public yet, but we are handling the project like open source, if you will. So all of our findings uh, are going to be published. We're going to make sure that this is as transparent and as public and distributed as possible in the spirit of Bitcoin. That's one of the things that makes Bitcoin so great is its transparency. And we want other towns to look at this as a case study and hopefully try to do the same thing in their town. So at some point, all of our writings and findings will be made public. And I will for sure keep everybody in the loop as to when we're going to do that. So awesome. Definitely a leader. People are soon to follow, Mr. Mayor. That's my thinking exactly. All right. We got five more minutes. I want to wrap it up. NVK, you've been sitting here uh, for a minute. I want to give you an opportunity to just chime in before we close it out. And then if you have anything to say, if not, then we'll pass it back to to Jason to, to finish out the space. But NVK, if you have anything you want to add, why don't you just jump in? Hey, I was just really enjoying a bit of a fresh air from a politician. This was very nice. No, I just want to think, what are you doing? It's amazing. There is a lot of people there that could uh, benefit from this tremendously. I think the trust is a great idea, is a good start. And yeah, no, just break a leg. In VK, I already, I think I know who you are because I know your voice. So I've been listening to you talk for a while, bro. Thank you so much for the knowledge over the months, man. And for your work. All the stuff you do, like being a pioneer in this space, you're a legend, bro. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. All right, cool. Jason, why don't you kind of close it out? Why don't you just give the spiel one last time what you're doing as the mayor and close out with any last asks for the audience for the Bitcoin Magazine odd? Bless you, CK. I thank you, Bitcoin Magazine, for allowing me to be here. Thank you, everyone who listened. I can't believe so many people listened to this conversation. What? Oh my God, like y- more of y'all are following me than people who live in my town. I'm so grateful. Yeah, my name is Jason. I'm a small town mayor. My goal in my term here is to push freedom forward by empowering the residents who live here to take control over their own lives. I'd like to see government pushed in more of that direction. My faith is not in government. My faith is in people, our hearts and our souls. And all the real innovation just comes from individuals, people who have the opportunity to try to do something great. And I just hope to facilitate that here and hopefully play a small part in facilitating this technology of Bitcoin around the world. I believe it is one of the most important inventions of all time. An engineering masterpiece is like a marvel and it still doesn't get the respect it deserves, but one day it will. God bless you all so much. Thank you for listening to me. I don't have an ask for you, only that follow me if you want to stay in touch. And at some point, I think I'm going to open this up so that more people can be involved. The support is absolutely overwhelming. I think I'm going to open this up to more people, to more organizations, to more people in the community. And just stay tuned because we're going to figure out a way to do that. God bless you all. Thanks for having me. All right. Bless you, man. Thanks for doing what you're doing, sticking your neck out, being a pioneer here and uh, being an awesome accidental mayor for Bitcoin. We definitely appreciate it and uh, glad that you are on Twitter. So I highly recommend uh, that you jump on more of these spaces and keep sharing your wisdom as much as possible. Thank you, bro. Like you got me here. I'm only on here because of you. And I'm, I'm grateful that you exposed me to this community because like I am meeting people that are just so inspiring. There is no more inspiring community on earth than Bitcoiners. And that's just the truth. Bitcoiners have solid morals. They're optimistic. They stick together. They, I don't know, there's just like this ethos in this community that it's so inspiring. It is so inspiring. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Bless up. Hey, I'm going to put in one last show for Bitcoin 2022, but you can meet Bitcoiners in person in Miami, April 6th through the 9th. Hopefully, Mayor Jason Stewart will be there. Hopefully, everyone else on this panel will be there. And hopefully, all of y'all listening will be there. Ticket prices go up tonight. If you want to go, don't hesitate. You can save $100 by buying in Bitcoin. You can use Strike and pretty much buy in Bitcoin with your credit card. I know there's a lot of other services do the same thing. And uh, yeah, use promo code Satoshi, save an an additional 10% off. So trying to get you those savings, trying to get you those in-person life-changing meetings, 
come to the conference. Don't miss out. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for listening. Jason, thanks so much for coming on. Everyone else on stage, thank you so much for, for providing your insights as well. And everyone in the audience, have a great day. Peace. Peace.